Start with doing that. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming to. Uh, okay. So it's not a VA. Hmm? Hmm? Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming to my presentation about database security for developers. Um, my name is Ilya Verbitsky, and uh, today I'm going to talk a bit about security. And uh, uh, first, let me give you a bit of a background. I spent uh, the last 15 years working for e-commerce and uh, finance industries. So, as you can imagine, those industries kind of keen about security, and that's important. Uh, currently, I'm a co-founder of Web Storting SRO, uh, where we're helping our clients to uh, to build uh, e-commerce projects. And um, and you know, since we are in e-commerce market, uh, we have PCI compliance, and they have like some. Uh, strict security policies, like some restrictions for us that we have to follow. And my interests are like solution architecture, system integration, and e-commerce. And before we'll go deep into technical question, I want to show you this slide. And uh, this is an estimated cost of bug fixing. So uh, imagine you're uh, starting a new project. And um, if you're like in the requirements, gathering uh, or doing some design architecture, even like when you're coding something, if you have a bug, then uh, the fix is cheap. We just pay a developer to spend another hour and like, go and fix it. When it's in the QA stage and you're testing it, then it's getting a bit more complicated because you run some integration tests. You will probably pay for next like four hours to fix it. Then you go to production. OK, production issues cost money. Uh, for example, if you're in a commerce field and you have a serious bug, then probably you can, your site can go shut down for a you know, couple of hours. You can lose some money because of that, but OK, like lost opportunities, for example. And the last one, we are hacked. So and uh, those issues are the most critical and really depending on of your business. Uh, for example, if you are uh, online, like if you're Facebook, for example, and you are hacked and like all data were leaked somewhere, then you're in a big trouble. Of course, if you like small grandpa shop that sells, I don't know, milk for somewhere, I don't know, in the Czech Republic, for example, then if you're hacked, it's not a such a huge issue for your business in particular because you have your local store and you say to locals, okay, somebody had stolen some email addresses. Okay, that's fine. But like for, uh, but, but for large businesses, that you, you really have to care about this thing. And it's not about money, it's uh, also about reputation. And for example, in finance sector, reputation is even more important than the uh, money you lose. So if, let's say, bank lost the reputation, then the, the business is screwed. And um, so today, we are going to talk about um, database security in particular. Because I, uh, from what I've learned uh, from my experience, I think developers don't think much about the databases. Uh, let's say you have a classical web application, and uh, you can use some frameworks to keep it secure on like application layer. You do some XSS protection, like security injection protection on like a new web app layer. But then, what happens if you have an error over there? If a hacker can go into your system and execute something, and uh, usually your system talks to a new database, and uh, what I've seen from my experience, 99% uh, of the apps, they just have an admin connection from your application layer to your database layer. Hopefully, it's not like a database admin. Uh, it might be like a just schema owner, somebody who owns the schema, but you can do writes, insert, deletes, whatever. So once your app is hacked, when your app engine is hacked, then your database is also hacked and you lost your data. And uh, when I was preparing this talk, I was trying to find out common uh, bugs, common issues from history. Unfortunately, I, found, I hadn't found anything for 90s, so probably nobody really cared about security in the 90s. <laughs> uh, I found some common vulnerabilities uh, from 2010. And uh, as you can see, like blank passwords, weak passwords, SQL injection, uh, bad privileges. Uh, some enabled database features, so probably somebody installed database from out of the box and forget to disable something. Broken configuration, buffer overflows. Yeah, it was uh, people were, did a lot of like native code at, at that time, so it was a big deal. Privileges, did you know what I'm Yes, you can see those are like the issues. And now the interesting part. To, we are here in 2018, and this is the list. 
broad user privileges, SQL injections, no audits, insecure backups, all the same things what we had in 2010 and probably in 1990 something, they're still here, there, and nobody really cares. Let's go and take a look to each of those common vulnerabilities and uh, try to find out the way how to protect against them. And uh, I'm going to uh, talk about PostgreSQL here. But really, any database like SQL Server, Oracle, they will all have the same things, probably called differently, probably like different SQL things, but uh, they have the same concept. OK, broad user privileges. Uh, from my experience, this is the most common problem nowadays. Uh, because uh, when somebody is developing an app nowadays, they just take the ORM and uh, they let the ORM to generate a database for them. And uh, usually the app has all possible privileges on a particular database. That is fine if you're in a development environment. But once you're running on a production, that's not good. Uh, and in my company, uh, we... Uh, we found out as a principle how to solve those issues. Like, first of all, um, if you have some monitoring users, like who's doing some logging, whatever, ju just give them permission, only permissions to read. Uh, and um, uh, when we're building, building a new app, we create a new database. And then uh, we start creating SQL. Uh, and like, I think like, developers should know how to write SQL. Uh, so what we do, we, we create our user and give him just read only permissions on a particular database. And um, uh, once you're starting developing, you see, OK, I need to write to this particular table, to this particular column. Then just go and update your, uh, your script. So, uh, and um, moreover, when you're, uh, when you're creating your uh, metadata objects, let's say tables, uh, what we are doing, we are adding the exact security policy for every single script we are writing. So it means next time you want to re reinstall the same database, we just have our script package, run it, and we have our security policy in place. Uh, what will, uh, yeah, it's like it takes time, so your development slows down a bit, so there are things that can, can help you. Uh, for example, for PostgreSQL, there is a good tool called PGTAP. That's a unit testing framework for Postgres. So you really like just write your, uh, your unit testing your database. And um, if you have your scripts and you are running the, those unit tests against the database where you have your security policy, then your unit test will fail if somebody cannot read. And then you just go to your log and see, OK, what happened? Why this particular user cannot write here? And if he should write there, or is something like broken in our uh, unit test? Uh, also, if you... Uh, um, you can go further. Uh, you can build, uh, if you're using your ORM, usually they're following the same structure. And um, nowadays, you, you have a uh, AST parser available for almost any programming languages, language open source. For example, for C Sharp that I'm using, uh, there's Roslyn. Uh, it's actually a compiler like, and the parser for C Sharp language. There's one for t TypeScript, like uh, Acron or Esprima, those are for JavaScript. So if you're using your ORM, then you can write your own static analyzer. It will not be like a, this, like a security-driven static analyzer like come from commercial product. But it will work for your particular database. For example, what we are doing, uh, we have some uh, scripts that use Roslyn, and they just look to our entity framework code and uh, fi uh, find the places where we write to the database and it just say, as, as the output, say, OK, in this particular file, you are writing to the database. Please check this code. Uh, another thing, if you go uh, to the more like generic level, uh, most of our database uh, of modern database engines support row level security. Uh, it, for example, Postgres supports it and the SQL Server supports it. Uh, what it means is you write your a special function or like your security policy saying, okay, for this particular, uh, when somebody is writing the table or querying uh, from the table, you can, you can write the code that checks, OK, if this user can access this particular row, and uh, you can configure like some where statement. 
uh, that might be very like very useful, especially like if you like an e-commerce field, like a PCI compliant thing, and not, let's say not everyone can read uh, credit card information and some uh, billing stuff and things. Uh, in case of Postgres, uh, there's also a tool called CPG SQL, and it brings uh, brings you mandatory level security, and it's part of CE Linux. Uh, yesterday we had a really great talk about CE Linux, how to configure it, and if you're running on the Linux server, just take a look to this product. Uh, the next common issue that is still applicable in 2018 uh, is SQL injection. Uh, the funny thing is, uh, usually developers thinking about SQL injection is just now code, so we write some SQL with string concatenations and boom, so something is broken. But it's not just about SQL that runs on the database. So you can have those classical exceptions, but you also can have SQL ex exceptions, I, and I saw it in my career, in stored procedures, because you can g run g uh, dynamic SQL within the database in stored procedure. And usually people don't think about, hey, can I break it somehow? Usually they just like, run dynamic SQL and think like, it will work out of the box. No, you can have SQL uh, injections this way. Another one is like SQL injection in connection strings. Um, that's not about SQL, uh, but for example, the samples I've seen is you have a uh, connection string that is uh, taking like database username and password. And in case you have a shared database account that works for different database, for example, you have staging server, you have production server. And uh, let's say you have your database on the same environment and you have some issues on your staging server. And if somebody can inject database name into your connection string somehow, then he can go with, uh, to production server with your staging code base and who knows what will happen. Also, a few words about ORMs. Uh, uh, many modern ORMs have their own SQL-like language. And uh, again, you can have SQL injection over there easily. And uh, for, I, I, I'm just talking from my experience. Such code examples when they have an injection in ORM SQL. And uh, people saying, yeah, you know, it's like it's ORM, so we cannot have SQL injection in ORM SQL. But well, it works. And uh, we're talking about uh, relation database here, but I would like to say that um, MongoDB, uh, uh, the funny thing with MongoDB or other known uh, NoSQL databases is uh, you can have injections, not SQL injections, but injections in those databases as well. For example, uh, when you're dealing with Mongo, you can pass the, some, some special query or you can modify the like, JavaScript that it's running on MongoDB server. So they are all vulnerable. And uh, I think that's a really important and big problem nowadays. And if you want to uh, automate some tools, so for example, that's good for, for testing. If you have a like, security testing team or you have a quality engineering team, they can use SQL map tool. That's a uh, hacking tool, I would say, uh, that can uh, run against your website and uh, it will scan it and try to find some uh, potential holes in the system. Uh, the next problem is missing audit. Uh, if you are, like, again, if you have in finance uh, or in e-commerce, PCI compliant environment, then you have uh, strict regulations about what should be audited. Uh, in on other projects, uh, sometimes people don't really care about much about that, and I think it's also a problem. Yes, on development environment, you don't need to go and configure the audit because it might be complicated, complex. But when you are production, just take your DBA, say, "Hey man, please run audit for us." And uh, especially for Postgres, it's really simple. First of all, uh, there is some uh, error reporting and logging uh, with the, built within the Postgres. Uh, that is enabled by default. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, if you're running on Windows, you can also send your Postgres errors to Windows logs and then do some Windows auditing tool for that. Uh, there's an amazing uh, extension called PG Audit, and this extension is just awesome. It logs everything for you. And if you're using it, uh, I would suggest to take a look to PG Audit Analyzer script. Uh, what it's doing, it just takes your, uh, parses your log file from PG Audit and load it into database schema. And you can do like normal SQL and query and analyze it and works pretty well. 
insecure backup storage. Uh, that's also a big story. Uh, it doesn't seem that like uh, too many people encrypt their backups if it's not in like a highly regulated environment. And uh, moreover, they don't even test the backup procedures and restore procedures. So first thing what to do is you, you have a backup, just test it, like uh, test your backups, try to recover your database server like once a month and see that it's really working and you're keeping your data. Uh, and uh, again, when you have backup, uh, try uh, document it. So just don't think that, okay, I have this magic script that runs somewhere in, in Bash and uh, when your DBA left the company, then it's like, oh my gosh, what should they do? Like, uh, who is doing backups? Just to make sure that like, your DBAs or like developers or DevOps uh, just have a document. Okay, we are doing backup this, this way and we can restore this, this and that. That's like, very important. And uh, make sure that your backups are encrypted. Uh, because the, like one of the again common issues in, in this database world is you can have encryption on the database level. Uh, you have a secure app and it works all works awesome. You have your database on an encrypted file system. Then you have backups and backups are, are, are non encrypted. What will happen is somebody can just break the, your file server and download those backups. They have they will own everything. And uh, the last thing is more about like this development and staging environment, uh, because again, from my experience, what I've seen so far is you have a development team, and usually they need a backup, and they just take a production backup if it's not a large project, and be happy just going exploring the, exploring the data. But if you have your product, if your production environment is highly secured, are you sure that like, your developer's laptop is that secure? as your production, but if somebody can break your developer's laptop why not via web browser exploit, then he can just go and download your database from developer uh, machine, and that's kind of a big problem. So uh, again, if we are on, in Postgres world, then uh, those two scripts are just really easy. You just can use OpenSSL to encrypt your backup, and then the same thing to decrypt your backup, just two lines of code. and you improve your security. Okay, uh, the next uh, problem uh, that's uh, not so uh, often appears nowadays uh, is uh, our vulnerabilities and configuration issues. Uh, I think people learn this lesson, especially people who are in DevOps world and the system administrative world, DBA world, that when you have, uh, when uh, Postgres uh, created a patch with security issue. Just install it as soon as possible. Uh, so the, the common practice is to uh, make sure that you deploy those all critical patches, uh, like no later than the months, because uh, exploit because after the months it's like 99% guarantee that exploit will be somewhere on like dark net. Uh, but you know I if you have uh, uh, if you can deploy uh, patches earlier than do it. For example, what may help is if you have like two environments, let's say you have a production environment and your NDR environment, and uh, if they are all in sync, so you can just uh, deploy your patches on the R environment, then switch your production to go to the DR environment, then deploy it on the uh, production environment. Uh, again, common practice, doesn't take too much time to implement, but it will increase your security. Uh, <laughs> that's funny, but... Um, I think it happened probably like a year ago or maybe two years ago when there was a major data leak uh, from AWS servers. So what happened was uh, on AWS without configuring any firewall, any protection, and uh, even no password because they thought that on, uh, they can connect to MongoDB only from local host. It wasn't the case. So some guys just throw the parser and they just really scan AWS IP addresses for Mongo ports and they just go connect and download tons of data. That was like a big deal. Uh, in, in case of Postgres, uh, there is a pghba config file and um, this is a file in Postgres where you can set up your um, information about your connections, uh, what protocols you support, what authentication protocols you support, and um, so just make sure that uh, you just explicitly list 
uh, the, your trusted connections, who can connect to your posters, not just allow everyone. And then use like stronger authentication mechanism. As, uh, for example, uh, Postgres 10 has this new encryption, me encryption mechanism based on Scrum uh, protocol. Uh, so in this case, uh, you're not sending a password over the network, it, you're sending just cache. Or if you are in an enterprise world, you can use like radio server or some LDAP uh, to do authentication instead of, in, instead of Postgres. That is good from my opinion. Uh, so again, limit your connections only for known IP addresses. So allow, allow just like, I know, allow just local host or uh, something like from your internal network. And uh, make sure that you're using SSL connection. It's not that uh, complicated to implement. You just build a SSL certificate, uh, add them to HP uh, Postgres and works. But in this case, you make, can be sure that nobody can in intercept into your network and steal the data. And yeah, antivirus. Yes, it runs on Linux world, but uh, probably I'm a, a bit paranoid. And yes, there are antiviruses for Linux. And yes, if you can, use them. The next common problem uh, is insecure data processing. And uh, uh, in PostgreSQL, we have uh, encryption on different levels. So different levels of encryption. Uh, the first level is your password, uh, password level authentication. So you can use rather uh, Scrum or MD5 algorithms to, uh, to do encryption for you. Of course, MD5 is quite weak nowadays. So uh, that's why they brought uh, Scrum to uh, to Postgres 10 because it's based on SHA 256, I guess. So that's qu quite hard to break. Or uh, yeah, that makes sure sure that you you are using SSL and you're not sending data across the network. Uh, then we can go down to the database level. Uh, there is a PG Crypto uh, extension for Postgres. Uh, that, break, uh, that has a lot of like functions like hashing, uh, like uh, asynchronous, synchronous encryption, whatever. It, it just works pretty well and fast. Uh, on the bottom level, you have um, the partition encryption. So uh, if you're running on Linux, you can bring your, put your database to NKFS or your CryptoFS. If you're running on Windows, you, you can use EFS. So it means your, your hard drive, physical hard drive is secure. Then uh, we have network encryption that is set up on PG uh, HBA. And uh, you can also implement a certificate authentication. So it means that only uh, hosts that have a certificate can connect. And um, you can also use client side encryption. If you don't trust your DBA, just uh, encrypt everything on your client side and then send encrypted byte array. In this case, you have no indexing, no searches, and yeah, you cannot run calculations. So you're really missing like all the benefits that Postgres or any other database brings to you. So think twice about that. But in the case of credit card information, for example, it might be helpful. Big passwords. Yeah, that's like a common thing. And uh, so in Postgres, you, uh, when you create a new user account, you can set up a timestamp uh, like when user has to change the password. Or you can use a password check module. Uh, what the module is doing, like when you're creating a new role, it checks your password again, call common things. Like it has to be like an alphanumeric and some digits. Uh, you can also add crack lip support to this thing. So it will also check about uh, against uh, common password databases. You can use Kerberos education, like some LDAP servers. That's even better because then you have like one common place for truth for all your password policies. And you can stop all the delay so to protect against brute force attack. And you can use like Metasploit, MD crack tools to, to check your password, like try to break your posters, for example. Danger of service attack, the last one, not quite common in the database world because usually all your database are behind the perimeter. But anyway, so make sure you have the latest patches, have a firewall, and have an anti DDoS solution if you need it. And that's summary. So Install updates. Uh, it's like a common summary. Uh, some steps that are easy to implement. And uh, thank you. Cool. We've got time for a couple of questions before we do.